oftentimes if vocal cords are weak and not producing great voice, we try to compensate for that by squeezing other muscles inappropriately. And oftentimes that's a compensatory behavior that we can see on exam. And you'll take a look for incomplete closure, which is another way of saying the vocal cords are too weak to close completely. And uh, these are all changes in laryngeal or voice box behavior that do have measurable impacts on voice quality. So if you take patients with myasthenia gravis who are complaining about their voice and you measure the frequency of their voice, the pitch of their voice, the stability of their voice, they'll all show up as abnormal as compared to patients who don't have any voice complaints. And we can measure these different variables such as noise to harmonic ratio, shimmer, things like that. Is it necessary to do that? No. Is it an interesting research tool? Sure, because it shows us that you know, we're not making it up. It's not something that we're only hearing. We can actually put numbers to the voice dysfunction that patients with myasthenia are coming to the doctor with. Uh, it can even, in extreme cases of weakness, begin to mimic vocal cord paralysis. If you have one side which isn't moving, it's a weak voice, it's a breathy voice, but sometimes both sides stop moving, and that can actually present with noisy breathing. Now, there's one patient in the literature, only one who's been described as a myasthenia gravis patient who was brought to medical attention because of breathing complaints, first and foremost. Both vocal cords were so weak that they didn't open. They thought that it was a bilateral paralysis. No one appreciated at the time that myasthenia gravis was the cause. So rather than treating immediately with edrophonium or anything like that, concern for the airway and paralysis led to tracheotomy. It was only several months later after the patient had had the tracheotomy was breathing better, and they looked and said, huh, the vocal cords are moving again. What kind of paralysis fluctuates and gets better that they thought, okay, let's test for myasthenia gravis. As related to swallowing, again, swallowing might be an early symptom of myasthenia gravis. It will eventually occur in about 40% of patients with myasthenia gravis. It won't occur in all or even most patients, however, with myasthenia gravis, and it may not be present right away, but may show up only later in the disease. So it's an uncertain relationship other than to say that it is one of those things that we keep an eye out for. Uh, although 85 to 90 percent, again, of patients with systemic or generalized myasthenia will have positive antibody tests, that number's cut almost in half with the, uh, the throat symptoms, cut even further if it's only a voice box symptom. So antibody testing may not be the most reliable guide to diagnosis in these patients. It's a painless phenomenon. So if I'm talking to somebody who has some of these same swallowing complaints, but they're telling me that it also hurts to swallow, my thoughts are for things other than myasthenia gravis. Uh, people can look at the muscles, and some of these studies I know that Jennifer had talked about, we won't belabor it, but we can, again, just like we can in voice with voice measurements, we can measure swallowing things like the length of a swallow, like the length of the time that the voice box has to be held out of the way to be safe. And we can realize that patients in my, uh, myasthenia gravis patients who complain of swallowing have measurably worse performance than patients with myasthenia gravis who don't complain of swallowing, who in turn have worse performance than patients who don't have myasthenia gravis at all. And the important part there is to realize that even the folks who aren't complaining of swallowing show up somewhere intermediate on that spectrum. So there are subclinical impacts, impacts that we don't recognize clinically yet, that the patient doesn't recognize as a problem swallowing, that we can say, well, you may not say that you're having problem swallowing, but we know your muscles aren't quite normal. So there's, again, a range there, and it's worth keeping an eye on. And that uh, muscle dysfunction is not limited to the throat, but also into the esophagus, where it takes longer to get food squeezed down the esophagus in patients with myasthenia gravis than it does in normal patients. And if you do the tensilon test or challenge, you can bring that length of time, that transit time, back towards normal. Uh, the peristaltic waves, the esophagus squeezing, squeezes less strong and more slowly. And those are changes that occur at every level of the esophagus, the top part, the middle part, and the bottom. And in addition to the measurable changes in esophageal constriction or contracture, there are also subjective changes that you can look at. Loss of coordination related to swallowing, frequently squeezing even though the food's not there, or squeezing in a way which isn't productively moving the food down. And all these things argue towards the impact that the nerve muscle disease, myasthenia, can have on function. So the big concern with swallowing complaints, the, the role of swallowing, of course, there are two things we want to be watching out for. Are you getting anything down the wrong pipe? That's aspiration. Are you getting enough stuff down the right pipe? How is, you, uh, how is your nutrition? Are you losing any weight? Are you malnourished or not? 
So if you're swallowing well, you answer no to the first question. I'm not getting anything down the wrong pipe, and you answer yes to the second, but I am getting enough into the stomach where I'm keeping my weight up. I'm not malnourished. I don't have protein deficiencies or anything like that. Aspiration, even in mild to moderate myasthenia gravis, will occur occasionally in up to a third of patients. And half of those folks may be having aspiration which is silent, meaning aspiration not accompanied by coughing or choking because they don't feel things going down the wrong pipe. And that's the concerning one for us because those folks may not be presenting for medical attention. You don't know what's happening. And simply asking about it may not reveal it. So I know that Jennifer talked a little bit about modified barium swallows or video swallows. And this is also where that functional endoscopic evaluation of swallowing can come in. You want to look for aspiration, even in a patient that can't tell you that that's the case. Aspiration is important not only because it can influence pneumonia, but because it is a burden for the immune system to try to fight off any emerging infection. It can itself trigger a myasthenic crisis.